Hello, my name is Dr. Morgan White. I'm a Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics Fellow here at the UC Davis Mind Institute, and today I'll be discussing complementary and alternative treatment of ADHD. So just a quick disclaimer, please consult a physician prior to instituting any complementary and alternative therapies, and special care should be taken in those who are children, elderly, pregnant or nursing, already taking medications, or with other chronic health conditions. So when we think about complementary and alternative medicine, we think about safety and efficacy. So if a therapy is safe and effective, then it's okay to use. If it's safe, but the efficacy is not known, it's certainly okay to try. If a therapy is not safe, but it is effective, then you can proceed with caution. However, if a therapy is neither safe nor effective, then it's really not worth the risk. And remember that safety is not the only issue. Other risks include time, money, and things like that. So approach to treatment. You want to think, what is the target symptom that you're going after? How does this treatment work? How impairing is the behavior? What are the risks and benefits of this treatment? How will improvement be determined? So first we're going to be talking about dietary supplements. Dietary supplements are not regulated by the FDA. They're required to have a facts label and ingredients listed, but the purity and quality of the ingredients is not overseen. Remember that natural does not necessarily mean safe, and that dietary supplements can have side effects just like prescription medications. Now we'll be talking a little bit about melatonin. So melatonin can help with sleep onset, and the long-acting formulation may help with sleep duration. It's also a potent antioxidant. Melatonin is safe and effective for short-term use. Side effects with melatonin are uncommon overall, and no significant side effects have been reported in children. Common side effects include drowsiness, headache, dizziness, or nausea. Melatonin tends to lose its effectiveness over time, so we recommend taking medication holidays when possible. Melatonin is typically dosed at one to three milligrams in children, three to six milligrams in adolescents, and up to 10 milligrams in adults. The sustained release formulation can be used in those who have difficulty staying asleep, but remember, the pill must be swallowed whole. Now moving on to vitamins and minerals. If a child is not deficient in a vitamin or mineral, then supplementation will likely not be of any benefit. Vitamins and minerals are preferably obtained from a nutrient-rich diet, and there may be risks associated for certain components. So to talk about multivitamins, they may help to prevent nutritional deficiencies in children who may have a restricted or limited diet. They're generally safe, but have unproven efficacy. Some risks are that many dietary supplements are fortified with several different vitamins. And if multiple supplements are being given, caution must be taken to avoid excessive intake of individual vitamins. The fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K can build up in the body and lead to toxicity when given in excess. You'll see here the maximum doses of A, D, and E for different age ranges. The water-soluble vitamins like B and C are cleared through the kidneys and have less risks of toxicity. So some caution with multivitamins. Excess vitamin A is not recommended in smokers due to increased lung cancer risks, and the retinol form of vitamin A is not recommended in pregnant women due to association with birth defects. Excess iron is not recommended unless necessary, and iron supplements are actually a leading cause of poisoning in young children. Caution should be taken with vitamin K and anticoagulation medications as it can increase the effect of the blood thinner. Vitamins should never be referred to as candy to children because this can encourage overconsumption. Vitamins, supplements, and medications should be kept secure from children. Now moving on to omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids are potent antioxidants that help with immune regulation and may affect neurotransmitters and prostaglandins. There are low levels of evidence reported in autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders that omega-3 fatty acids are safe and may be beneficial. A common side effect of omega-3 fatty acids is GI upset. Wild-caught, cold-water fatty fish are recommended as a source of omega-3 fatty acids. Smaller fish often have lower levels of mercury, and while the appropriate dose has yet to be determined, about one gram per day is commonly recommended for adults. Remember that three ounces of salmon have about one to one and a half grams of omega-3s, and supplements should be lab certified low in heavy metal. DMAA or geranium extract is an ingredient found illegally in some dietary supplements. It's often touted as a natural stimulant and in combination with caffeine can elevate blood pressure and lead to cardiovascular problems. 
Now we'll be talking about some dietary interventions. Elimination diets of certain food additives may be effective at reducing ADHD symptoms. Now this is not the few foods elimination diet. Those are not recommended. And that's when you're limiting the child to a handful of hypoallergenic foods. Consultation and follow-up with a registered dietitian is recommended for any elimination diet. And lab studies have not shown to have any benefit before or after implementation of such diets. Removal of artificial food coloring from the diet improved parental rating of hyperactivity in one meta-analysis. Removal of artificial food coloring may actually reduce hyperactive behavior in all children. The UK requires warning labels on foods with artificial food coloring, but the FDA has recommended further research prior to recommending labels in the United States. So take home message for diets include Children with ADHD who consume a well-rounded, whole food, minimally processed diet have a more favorable outcome than those who do not. Artificial food coloring and preservatives should be avoided. Packaged food ingredient labels should have a short list of easily recognizable ingredients. And special diets should be strictly adhered to for at least one month with systematic symptom monitoring. Now to talk about some mind-body therapies. We know that exercise is important for everyone, but especially those with ADHD. Exercise allows children to expend energy, learn self-regulation skills, form peer relationships, and is proven to improve the core symptoms of ADHD. Yoga and massage may have benefits. Homeopathy has not proven to be effective. And chiropractic manipulation is possibly harmful and not recommended. Following are not yet supported by evidence and each carries some degree of risk, including acupuncture, neuro or biofeedback, and transcranial magnetic stimulation, all of which require more research. So in summary, it's recommended that you get enough restorative sleep, you get plenty of exercise, you may consider adding a multivitamin and mineral supplement containing iron and vitamin D, we recommend that you eat well. Consider adding an omega-3 supplement. Now it's important to note that the dietary interventions and the omega-3 supplements, they have an effect size that's only a quarter of stimulant medications, which continue to be recommended as first-line therapy for the impairing symptoms of ADHD. I've provided some resources for complementary and alternative medicine, specifically the National Institutes of Health National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, along with some other resources.